E agora com vocês, apresentando o Serenity de by Design, Dave Malu. Well, Gene, um, as you said, my name is Dave Malouk, and uh, I'm a principal designer at Rackspace, and we're a company that does um, outsource information technology, hardware, bandwidth. If you want to put a computer up on the internet, we do that for you. We do the cloud. It's all good. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, yeah, you, So, I'm here to talk about serendipity, or I'm here to talk about, like, how to be ready for serendipity, and where serendipity happens, and how to use serendipity. So, serendipity are happy accidents. So, I want to tell you a story about a happy accident to give you a sense of what it means, and what it could mean for you, not just as a designer, but in your life. So, about... Eight months ago, I was looking for my next thing. Um, I was interviewing for jobs, I was looking to be a consultant, I was doing so many different things, and um, nothing quite fit, nothing quite felt right. But I was searching, I was hunting. And during that hunt, um, I actually got an interview with IBM. I was going to be their global teacher for interaction design in a brand new studio in Austin, Texas. Sounds great. So I go, and the night before my interview, I meet a friend in Austin, Texas, uh, for dinner. And the whole night, I notice he's texting. He's like, you know, texting someone. Part of me is like, well, that's rude. Part of me is like, yeah, whatever. And then at coffee, dessert, all of a sudden, his boss walks into the restaurant, sits down, and basically starts interviewing me. I had no awareness that this was going to happen, and no, wasn't ready at all, right? I was not like in interview mode, I was like having fun with friends, I actually had a few drinks already. But that interview turned into my next job. So I didn't get the job at IBM, I got the job at Rackspace. That's a happy accident. And being open to the possibility of happy accidents, being ready for those things, is what this is going to be about and how to apply that to design. So, um, but we're not just here to talk about serendipity, we're here to talk about serendipity by design. And that seems like an oxymoron, but what it's about is how can you set up your work environment so that you're ready to use serendipity, to use accidents. And there's two things to look at. One is to have an open mind. And an open mind is two ways. You need to open your mind to spill things out as much as it is to be an open mind to get things in. And the other key element on this slide is you need to have the right space. Because things can happen better in certain kinds of spaces than others. Fortune favors the prepared mind, as Louis Pasteur said. And this picture is of a super collider in CERN Geneva. And the reason I use this is that for an atomic physicist, this is their studio. This is their preparedness for serendipity to happen. What they're doing is, is they're saying, I'm going to collide two atoms together, and instead of letting them go boom, Right? and making a big mess, I'm going to set up this huge machine around that activity so I can measure what's going to happen. I can be ready for it and then discover stuff that I didn't even know was going to happen. Right? And that's what we do as designers. We create connections. We create these moments that go boom and we don't know what's going to happen. We can't know what's going to happen and it's the not knowing that empowers us. So for me, design in this serendipity kind of preparedness session 
breaks down into four parts. The first one is the environment. So you need to have the right environment, the right space, right? But you also need to be using that space appropriately. You have to have a solid practice that enables serendipity to happen as much as the space to be able to capture and measure. But you need to have knowledge as well. You need to have knowledge of the things that you're trying to accomplish. Um, you need to have a sense of history, a um, sense of theory to what you're working on. And lastly, you need to have criticism. You need to be able to critique effectively what it is you're doing. And we're going to talk about all four of these things. So first we're going to talk about the environment. And what is a studio? A studio, the word, is as useless as design or innovation by itself. But we can hone it to mean something for ourselves. Right? And that's what we're going to do here. But first I want to take a look at the artist studio. Because so much of what I want to talk about is about how art offers us the way to understand how serendipity works. Okay? And what I notice in this picture, as much as it's kind of blurry over here, is it's a single person working in this studio, right? But the materials are so accessible. Right? There's a workspace where they can do work, but the materials are just there and available to them. And this question of material and availability of material is one that's really interesting to me since we are digital designers, right? What material do we have available to us as we do this? I had a wonderful conversation with a uh, dear mentor of mine, um, Robert Fabricant, and I was showing him an application that I'm developing around creating a studio online and um, some uh, real pet project that I'm working on. And what came out of that, you know, user test, if you will, was this sentence, that the studio is not um, static, that it's dynamic, that it's, it's not a room. It's a canvas, and how do we make that canvas is going to be a big part of what we talk about. So, the physical space. So, there's physicality and there's culture and what it brings to you. So, we're going to talk about the physical space. Wall space. Probably one of the toughest things to do in today's world is to create wall space. Because all we want to do is to have big open spaces Right? Which is also good um, in some ways, bad in other ways. But we need to have wall space to work on. And these three pictures represent three things. I need to have wall space to collaborate. So on the far left, I'm collaborating around this um, sticky note. Right? I need to inspire. So I have a poster of Steve Jobs in my studio. Right? Um, this is a painting of brain baby of Steve Jobs. And so I'm inspired by that. And then the last thing I need wall space for is to share. I have to be constantly able to share what I'm doing um, in order to get feedback, to get the collision, the boom, to happen. But for all of this to happen, you need line of sight. You need to have clear line of sight. And something that's happened in the modern era is that line of sight has gone away, even in the most open spaces. Line of sight has gone away because we are so focused on this. Imagine your setup at your desk. You have a big monitor or even your laptop, and the focus that goes on into that has decreased the amount of line of sight we have when we're working. Yes, I can stand up and I can see things, but I probably can't see nearly as much today as I used to be able to in an architecture studio or a graphic design studio from the 1950s or an industrial design studio. Free computation. We've lost the line of sight and we need to bring it back. But it's not just our sight that's important, it's our hearing that's important as well. We need to be able to overhear things. In the United States, we talk about the water cooler being this nexus of social activity, of gossip and stuff like that. But we need to create other, um, other atmospheres that allow people to overhear and talk about where that's valuable. Um, so what do you need to bring to make this work? So that's the space to make it work. But what do you need to bring to make it work? 
because it's not just the space that matters, it's the culture that we create. And the first and foremost thing you need to do, as I mentioned already, is an open mind. The open mind is a two-way street. Yes, I'm open to receiving anything, but I have to be just as open to giving back. Okay? It's a two-way street that needs to be available for people. This is another challenge for people that's also a two-way street, is I need to be able to both take and give criticism. I've noticed when I work with people, especially when I was working as a professor uh, with students, is that usually it's a one-way street. There are the students who can take criticism, and they stand there and they, they take it, and there are students that can give criticism. But you need to be able to do both, and you need to do it from the position that everyone in the organization has value to give to it, no matter how junior or senior they are, that they have that value. And that value doesn't mean just about criticism, the opinion. That value comes down to teaching. When I was a teacher, I learned more from my students in four years of teaching than I did in the previous 15 years of being a practitioner. My students taught me so incredibly much uh, in my teaching career uh, from the very day I walked through the door. Your students are your best teachers, and your teachers are your best students. And it's a two-way street to make that work. The next thing is, and this is, this is a hard thing, I struggle with this one tremendously, is to be able to move between focus and distraction. They're both important. You need to be able to have focus when you do your work, but you also need to be able to be open to the distraction of people interrupting you, to give criticism, to give teaching moments, right? Um, you need to be able to distract yourself so that you can go and reflect and relax. You need to be able to do both. Focus on the work and find moments of distraction. The last thing you need to bring is a spirit of exploration. You need to be able to want to go towards something that's unknown. You don't know where you're going. It's not even a hypothesis per se. You're just going in a direction. You're exploring possibilities as much as you're exploring the nature of a hypothesis, testing a hypothesis. Right? It's the unknown, it's the, it's the going into the beyond, the great beyond. Are there sea monsters out there or not? Right? <clears throat> Sorry, dry throat. So what does this all do for you? Um, first thing it does that I believe is it creates a flow. It creates two kinds of flow from what I've experienced. Um, the, the easy one is it creates a flow of information, a flow of ideas, a flow of uh, creativity. And that's the main thing it creates. But believe it or not, for me, it creates a flow in my work. Because I have a confidence in my work that I didn't have before when I didn't use these spaces. And by having that confidence of having everyone behind me working together in this studio fashion um, really helps me concentrate on the work that I'm doing when I have those moments of concentration. <clears throat> Next one's collision. Things are colliding together. It's the point of the studio. It's to create the collisions, right? This is the, from the Matrix, and they're in the big city, and everybody's colliding into each other. And the reason I use this picture isn't for the woman in red so much as a reminder that um, there was a study done years ago that showed that most innovation occurs where there are more pedestrians in the city than the people who are driving. We bang into each other. And that theory of banging into each other is so important in order to create ideas. And in places where there are more cars and pedestrians, it's the cities where people have created a transient corporate culture, where they move every two years to another company, like in Silicon Valley, where the idea is new, the innovation happens, as opposed to Boston, where for years they just say, can I get a gold watch at my 25th anniversary, right? Innovation drops in Boston. Innovation grows in Silicon Valley. You need to have an inspiration and get inspired. You know, I put this one up. This is actually my inspiration even more than Steve Jobs is Walt Disney. When I first took my son to Walt Disney World and you walk up to the castle, which is amazing in and of itself, I saw this picture of Walt and I cried. I seriously cried because he was truly a visionary of culture, imagination, technology, 
storytelling, unlike any person I know of before or since, a combination of the impossible and making it possible. And I love them for that. The studio creates social for you, right? The water cooler. It makes people connect if it's done correctly. Right? The space is right, if the culture is right, it makes people correct, connect. And that connection is how the flow happens that was mentioned before, right? The flow of going around and around ideas, the ideas shifting all the time through every connection. In my studio class yesterday, I played a game with the students and we called it a new form of telephone. And instead of playing the game where you whisper in somebody's ear and then whisper in somebody else's ear and see how the phrase comes out the other end of the chain, we did it through sketching instead and drawing pictures. Right? And new things happen through the class because of that. Right? They play telephone in a new way. And it's really important to be open to that serendipity. If a studio is done right, there are places to be comfortable. There are places to relax. And you need these spaces in order to reflect. If you're not reflecting on your work and have those moments to do that, a personal reflection, not just group reflection, um, you won't be able to do the whole process when they're discussed. And the reflection doesn't just happen at moments of like sitting on a couch or reading a book, which is good too, but they happen at moments of play. And play is a really important thing to encourage in organization. We have um, Nerf guns, it's a big deal in my company. Um, so at any moment you can get shot in the head um, with a Nerf gun. I hope that translates. Please, looking at the black box. Um, so, but we have fun with each other, and we play with each other, and we have games all over in the classic dot com boom sense of ping pong and foosball. And the reason we have all of this is because play is not just for fun, or fun is not just fun in and of itself. Fun is practice. Fun is pattern recognition. And this book, um, The Theory of Fun, does an amazing job of explaining why and how people react to things and why we have fun at some things and not fun at others. And when we're having fun, we're learning. You're constantly learning if you're having fun. Once you stop learning about something, once you start stop having recognizing, you stop having fun. And once you see that, you need to find something else. You need to enliven yourself. You need to find other patterns to create in what you're doing. So that was the, um, the studio. So that's the space, the environment. So now we're going to talk about the crowd. We're going to talk about practice, what it is we do. And what, what it is we do generally, and what, it is, what is craft, and then what it is it means to digital designers. So what is craft? And I looked it up. I, like, I looked up Wikipedia, I looked it up on dictionaries and Google and everything else. And these three things really came to mind. And what's interesting is that the top two things all relate to working with your hands. And I found that really interesting because I don't really think of myself as working with my hands so much. But I do. I whiteboard almost every day I'm on a whiteboard. Right? I don't sketch on paper too much, that's my personal place. But I whiteboard almost every day on my job. And that's using my hand. And there's a cost to using a whiteboard. Right? There's some special thing that comes out of that. Maybe I can't sell it in a, in a market, but there is a craft there. So I want to talk about our craft. And what crafts mean? Because I think there's something to thinking about craft that's really important. So this is like a prototype of a BMW. It's amazing. The whole exterior is made of cloth. But what I love about it is the importance of the line in this car. I love the lines. I love how the slit on the eyes, the cloth actually closes over the eyes as that eyelid. You know, it gets so, like the lines are just so telling. Um, make expressions using the cloth out of the eyes um, and create new forms. But my favorite part and most important part of craft isn't so much the form, but it's around tolerances. This is a watch, watch by Vacheron Constantine. The watch itself costs about $400,000. There's two or three made a year. But that's not what makes it special for me, though that is really special. What makes it special for me is the tolerances. This is a work of perfection, which is why it takes so long. Right? Tolerances means the space, the detail. Right? 
right? It's that space between the gears are so perfectly aligned in this system that if you run it for hundreds of years and never wear it and never get off time, it's so perfect for tolerances. But there's other things besides things that have tolerances or have form. I love watching dance. Dance to me is one of my favorite things to do, right? It's, it, it creates this musicality, this line, this form, and it shows tremendous. Wow, is it just like the Super Bowl? <laughs> um, I could talk. <laughs> it's not a blackout, because there's other ways. So, um, so there's line and there's form and there's motion and the combination of them are so important. And the reason I love dance, so people who may have seen another presentation I've done, is because as we become a more gestural interface society, right, we are dancing with our devices and dancing with this device right now. Right? I'm making a little bit of mistakes because my craft isn't good with it, right? But I'm using it, I'm dancing with it, I'm swiping, I'm having a sense of aesthetic response to that. The motion is really important. And more and more audio is becoming important. And the way that we can manipulate tone is really important in what we do. You know, I, we take it for granted a certain thing where like, audio is kind of like left the web. And people try to bring it back sometimes, but it never works. Yet it works so well on fixed client devices for some reason. Like we take them for granted there, but on the web we just say we don't need it. I think we need to work on bringing it back because there's a special aesthetic there that we need to have. Information in there. And the last craft that I want to talk about is emotion and performance. You know, here I am, I'm trying to elicit my passion about this topic to you. Hopefully I'm succeeding, right? I'm doing a performance. And there's something to that. There's something to what we're doing. And so much about what our devices are doing is creating a moment of performance. When I use my phone, I'm performing with it. As a user-centered designer, I need to be able to think about how to craft other people's performance the way that a director in a movie or a play crafts this gentleman's mastery of performances, right? It's a collaboration that we have with our user who are the actors in the movies that we're creating, the improvisational movies. But what is our craft? I really struggle with this question sometimes. And the things that we go back to feel too tied to something, right? So for example, I go to creative and visual thinking. Creative thinking definitely is around, right? It's, it's broad, it's horizontal, it's like everything. But visual thinking, we're not always visual, right? If I create a voice-activated system, there's nothing visual there that I'm creating as a final artifact, or is there, right? Don't I have to create artifacts in the process of creating that system so that people who are responsible for creating it can do it. The voiceover person needs to read a script, right? The person who's saying, you know, yes, press one to do this, press two to do that. They need a script in order to put all of that information in. That's an artifact. I need to talk to engineers. They need artifacts to do that. And those can be presented through visual thinking, through visual artifacts. So even the most non-visual part of what we design probably still needs visual thinking to help us. We represent things. More than we build things, we represent things as designers. And I know that we're pushing towards designers building, and I don't have any problem with that. But first and primary, if we can't represent what we do, then we can't build it, right? So this is not a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe, right? We represent what we do. I don't, an architect doesn't build the building. They create the representation of 3D models and blueprints. It's not the building that they do. A civil engineer and a set of construction can make that happen. And that's fine for that medium and that economy, right? And that happens in many other parts of design as well. We model me. Model making to me is a wonderful part. The model making is like prototyping, but we also model make in the abstract. So in this picture, you have architecture students who are just doing form. They're learning their craft of form, of three-dimensionality. What looks good? What kinds of lines look good? 
right? What kinds of forms, what kind of curves you could in these models? These are all straight forms, and the problem that they're working on is rectilinear forms and how to combine them together to make something better, right? So going back to creative thinking, classical creative thinking, we think about, well, I brainstorm, I ideate, and then I evaluate, right? There's a moment when we say we stop, but now we evaluate. And I think of this as old school way of thinking about creating, about being creative, because it's too linear of a process, right? Even if I do something like this, um, engineering thinking does that as well. They go out and then they come in, but they do it on a straight line, right? That's the engineering way of thinking about how to move forward. And I think we're losing, I think we're getting stuck in that again as designers. Right? As more and more of our work gets tied to actually doing engineering, we're losing what is design thinking, which is the ability to go backwards. To measure, to go, not to measure, but to go back to the previous idea as a connection to the new idea to form something wholly new again. Right? And then this breaking of things, this non-linearity of things, to me, is the key to what we do as creative thinkers. And we need to find again our processes. And the best sample of this is within sketching. To me, sketching is the best example if it's done right. And it's not done right unless you have the right intentionality. The intention is what's important. And here you have this chart by Bill Buxton from his book Sketching User Experience, where you have invitation versus attendance, suggestion versus description, and on and on. But the key factor is. When I sketch, I'm asking to collaborate. I'm asking you to think with me when I sketch about the solution. I'm not asking you if it's good or bad. I'm asking you to think with me, and that's really different. And what's important is communicating that intentionality. Because I can put up, and I have put up, balsamic style, you know, um, wireframes that are done in sketchy strokes, right? And I still had clients treat them like prototypes. So the reason is, is because I didn't communicate the intention correctly. And these properties up here of making it fast, disposable, rough, having multiplicity of, of ideas presented at the same time, and finally using a common visual language, all together communicate that it's a sketch, right? If it's disposable, I know not to treat it as something that I'm going to keep forever. If it's rough, really rough, and done fast, and there's multiple ideas, I know that I'm not done, that I'm asking you to engage, and creating a new intentionality. <clears throat> I love this quote, and I'm just gonna read it, because uh, it's translated, normally I don't like to read slides like this. I actually did the work on the paper, Feynman, who's a famous inventor, said, well, Wiener, the person interviewing, tries to ask for clarity and says, the work was done in your head, but the record of it is still here. So he's thinking of the paper as the record. And then Feynman comes back and says, no, it's not a record, not really, it's working. And this is the other powerful thing about sketching is, you have to work on paper and this is the paper, right? The work is the paper, because the work is in dialogue with the person. Without the paper being a place to externalize the ideas in the head, right? You don't have the dialogue with yourself through the process. And you need to be able to do this quickly, like a conversation, and that's what sketching offers, is that quick conversation. And what this all brings is associative thinking. When I say associative thinking, you can go back to the very basic of cognitive psychology where someone asks, someone puts out the word blue, right? And the next person says sky, right? It's common, and that's associative thinking. You just put out the next thing. But what's really interesting is when you do associative thinking is that if I said sky by itself, I may not have gotten blue. I may have gotten clouds. But if I say blue and then sky, the next associative thing may be different because blue, which was previous, affects the chain of association. So associations aren't just one-offs. 
That's why the linearity doesn't work. Associations are contextual. Right? And they work alone, but they work really excellently with others. By putting your sketches up there, or even by sketching next to somebody. We talk about paired coding, right, in today's coding environment. I loved seeing my students when, when I was teaching, they were doing paired sketching. They would put a big white sheet of paper in front of them, and they would just sketch together. And sometimes they would impact each other directly, like putting a line on the other person's sketch. But just by having it in their line of sight so directly impacted the work that they were doing. And you can see that as they iterated forward. So I want to go to visual language for a second. Because a lot of people are scared of sketching. They think they can't draw. And I agree with you. You probably might not be able to draw. But it doesn't mean you can't communicate visually. Because if you can do these six shapes in some way, you can draw. Right? So this is um, from Ed Emberley. He makes these books for children to learn to draw. I helped me, let alone my son, learn to draw. It was like one of my favorite discoveries was these books when my son finally got interested in drawing. And we actually did this in my class and everyone had a good time. Um, but drawing a dragon, a dragon is that easy, right? Just putting those combination of shapes together to communicate dragon. No, it's not a fancy dragon, it's not three-dimensional, it's not in perspective. I don't need that to communicate the idea of there's a dragon here. And that's what visual communication is all about. It's getting the idea across. It's a sketch. It's disposable. It's not the refined idea. But visual communication doesn't have to be drawings of people or life objects, right? This is so easy to draw. These are the drawings on a specification for doing um, gestures, for designing gestures. So on the bottom, um, the bottom left one, well, oh, yeah, your left, um, over here, what you get is the down triangle is saying that's where you click down, and the up triangle is saying that's where you click up, and the circle implies movement, implies the click itself, and the arrow implies the direction of the mouse is going or the swipe is going, right? Really simplistic visual um, thinking going on there, visual communication. This next one is a little bit more complicated. This comes from um, contextual design, the Holtzblatt and Bayer methodology for, for modeling a cultural environment after your research. And this is just modeling flow. And just to talk about the visual here, is there's four types of visual symbols that you need to know. The ellipse represent people in the system. The, um, the boxes represent things, so that's nice, that's a good dichotomy, really easily visually represented. The lines represent the flow of something, usually information or an object or something like that. And then the red lightning bolt says there's a problem here, there's a breakdown in the system. So I only need to understand four things and then I can read basically this visual diagram and understand the whole culture, right, from, a, from an interview session. So, that was craft and what we do. Now we're going to move into knowledge. <clears throat> so I want to start with our history. And what I did was here is I put on the left side art. And I put a moment in art in particular, uh, which is Lautrec. And he was an amazing artist who became a graphic artist. Because his art became the cover of magazines right? and posters amazing stuff. He was the first crossover, in my mind, in graphic arts. Um, and then on the far left, you have the age of industrialization. And then in the middle, you have design. And design is sort of this reflex between the needs of the industrial complex, and the post-industrial complex, right? But the ability to use art at the same time. In, uh, industrial design in the United States, unlike in Europe, actually was built from technology schools before art schools. Because they were responding to this side of it. And it wasn't until the 50s or 60s where art schools started to take on industrial design, for example. Right? 
So we in the United States were really into the industrial side of things, much more so than in Europe. So art and design um, are, to me, tied together. They're not the same thing. It doesn't matter if they are or they aren't. But what's clear to me is that design without art isn't really good. That's what I really want to say. It's not design to me. Right? It's just because you're solving a problem doesn't mean you're designing. There's many ways to solve problems. And to me, the way you solve problems is by using art as your method. Right? If you can um, use art as artistic methods, then you're doing design. And you're not just conceiving something. You're not just engineering it. Right? And yeah, maybe it doesn't matter how you create something. Right? And I can live with that. If what you feel comfortable being an engineer and thinking that way, that's great. But I think there's something really important and powerful about what art offers design. And we're going to talk about what that is. So here we have Bilbao, so, you know, the famous Frankieri Museum in Spain. And then next to that is the um, Bird's Nest Stadium. And I put these up here as amazing examples of functional art, big scale functional art. And we think about this in terms of like postmodernism, and some people think it's ugly and liquid. And, not, not practical, and it's a stark attack who creates it. But you know what? No one was saying that about Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is just as liquid, and just as beautiful, and just as artistic as the, the Frank Geary. Frank and Frank are from the same breed of architect. Right? You can look at tons of Frank Lloyd Wright's architectural works and see that. Right? And what I really love is going back even further to the Art Deco movement, which is parallel to the Bauhaus movement. And I love that they don't remove decoration from this. My favorite part of the Chrysler building are the, the eagle gargoyles at the very top. Right? A Bauhaus person would never put gargoyles on a minimalist, would never put gargoyles on a skyscraper. Right? And that's where you end up with the Empire State Building, which is stayed and boring and straight lines all the way through without a glimmer of silver, without a single curved line to how it's formed that you can see from the distance. Right? Just don't do that. So modern design isn't all about minimalism, and that's what I want to talk about. Because I think there's been this huge push to minimalism, and I don't want that to be the only conversation we're having. And when you compare the Bauhaus, which is minimalist, and the best example is the Tel Aviv apartment in the top right, and you compare that to the Art Deco on the bottom, you can see that contemporary buildings, both modernist, can be different and still have value in terms of the, the beauty and the function of the designs that they offer. And that this doesn't translate to architecture, right? that translates to the things themselves. One of my favorite architect archetypal designs is the KitchenAid um, mixer. I love that design. It is probably one of the longest lasting designs in all of industrial design. It hasn't changed significantly at all, probably in like 80 years since it first came out. 80 years that design has lasted, and it is not minimal. There is curve, there is decoration, there is a balance in that. Right? And it has lasted so long. So moving from history, I want to talk about theory. And in talking about theory, it's important for us to have a set of foundations in what we do. This is an example from the Pratt School. I'm sorry, I had to photograph a book for this. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and what they're talking about in this industrial design class is creating a language, a critical language, talking about how forms have more than one shape in them, right? So in this case, this form has three shapes, and we have a dominant, a subdominant, and a subordinate. Right? And they can talk about that shape, and talk about how, well, you need to add this or remove that in order to create the balance required for this total form to feel right. And so they create a set of foundations around line and form and color and texture 
and volume and negative space. Right? And those become the foundations of industrial design, most of which are also the foundations of graphic design. But in graphic design and in art, we learn so much from the theory. Right? We can create moments in art that are evaluated. I can do comparisons. And that has value in communicating something. And maybe the communication isn't what I'm communicating to you, but what you can communicate back to me directly or indirectly. Right? The artist in this case isn't saying one is better than the other, but he's asking, he's asking the question of you to decide for yourself which side is better. Or maybe he's asking for you to combine them. Right? But we get to do that. We get to ask questions in the work that we do. So we get to expose. So the classic story of the David is Michelangelo saying uh, he emerged from the marble. He was exposed through the medium, right? But we also get to balance that with construction, too. We get to build things. And in the process of building, things emerge as well. You can, ex you can remove things to expose, and something will emerge, but you can also build things, and as you build, something will emerge. Both processes are really valuable, and they're both tools of art. So this deconstruction, reconstructing is really important, and the, the best way I've been able to talk about it is in cooking. So fancy chefs love to deconstruct the meal. And it didn't occur to me a lot. Like I'm, not a, I'm not a foodie. I'm not a person who's like into big, you know, fancy cuisine. But it occurred to me that the reason they do that is to offer the, um, the person eating the food a chance to create their own experience. Because if I deconstruct it, let's say I deconstruct a chicken cordon bleu, I got chicken, ham, cheese, and sauce, right? I'm just easily breaking it down. So I deconstruct it. I have a little piece of chicken, because you can't make things too big, a little piece of ham, and a little piece of cheese, and a, a line of sauce going in front of the plate, right? It's a plate kind of thing. So my first bite, I decide I just want chicken and sauce. My next bite, I want cheese and ham. And my next bite, I finally put it all together. I get to experience the reconstruction because somebody deconstructed it. And maybe my favorite bite is a different combination than what the recipe pre-deconstructed would have created. Right? But as designers, we get to go through that process ourselves. We get to deconstruct things, see all the pieces laid out, and then figure out new ways to connect them, figure out new associations to make in the parts themselves. Right? I think that's one thing that the iPhone really represents is, you know, it was really clear that all the parts existed previously before an iPhone was made. Every single part on this phone in 19, 2007 existed then that was necessary to make it. But it was the way that they deconstructed the technology and then built something new out of it. Something completely innovative to constructing it in a new way. Right? And tinkering is an important way to do this. So in the United States, we have a huge tinkering movement. We call it the maker movement. And we have maker fairs now all over the country. And there's huge, thousands and thousands of people come because they can make robots or they can make airplanes or whatever they're interested in making. Um, but the example here that I'm using is goes back to Degas. And Degas had this amazing practice of tinkering in bronze statues before he would start painting his ballerinas. He would first do them in a bronze statue. This is no simple sketch, right? This is not special. This is not rough. This is not disposable, right? This is tinkering. This is making something in order to figure out how I'm going to make something else. Completely unrelated to the final form, which was this, which is refining. Right? I go through a process of refining what it is I'm going to work on. And when I refine it, I need to make sure that it's composed. This is the classic photography grid over this picture, making sure there's a, a two-thirds, right? At least making sure the face is pointed in the middle as opposed to pointed out. And composing the picture to make sure that the aesthetic, make sure the communication is correct. And we have to do that through layout and type and um, 
puzzle and white space in what we do as visual designers on screens. We need to make sure there's a balance in what we do. One of my least favorite things about the classic top left bar design that defined the web for so many years is it's so unbalanced. It's so weighted in one direction. There's no balance to it. And it's really difficult to balance it. And people try by making a very weighty left right bar and putting categories or actions over there. And it kind of just fell, kind of fall apart, right? And I think there's some good things coming up in responsive design that helps some of that. Um, but we're still lagging a little bit and having a really strong balance in web design. What we are good at is contrast, right? We're good at making sure that people see the search box, right? Or making sure people see the sign up button. Or using contrast. We create some kind of contrast within the screen in order to do that. Negative space is a really important concept. Are this, is this a box or is this two spaces? It's a classic you know, example of negative space use. But my favorite example is the FedEx logo, right? Federal, Federal Express, and there's the E and the X making an arrow. But there's better ways to use it than that. By using negative space, instead of using lines to create separation, we're removing distraction that's just unnecessary. It's not even aesthetically pleasing. Right, the lines that we put when we want to separate one section from another section. When white space is all you probably really need, and then you can create hierarchy by using scale. Right? I love this example of scale because for anyone who's been to Florence and has seen the real thing, he's huge. Huge. He's like three of me tall. Right? But the other part about scale that's really interesting in this is the hand. The hand is that of a gorilla, not of a human being. And this is from a master of anatomy. He has, like, Michelangelo probably dug up more corpses than any vampire ever, right? Any zombie, in order to really understand the human body. And the rest of it is absolutely stunning and perfect, except for this hand. It's just laying there like a gorilla hand. What is that? He's asking a question. It doesn't make Right? It's too perfect for that. And the next question that goes through my mind is materiality. And material, is it code? So I put that up there to see if it is code. Is it people? Right? Is our median behavior? Is what we do just code? Is it pixels? A lot of people don't talk about the pixels that we do. Is it just the output of the code that's our medium? Right? So is it voice, is it sound, is it pixels, is it visual? Um, is it the sensors and actuators that you put together in a physical device? It's probably all of that and a mix of that. And, but because it's all intangible and so complex to get our head around, we actually use working with material as a craft. We don't become experts in any of it because we have to work with all of it. And I think that's part of one of our struggles in making the quality that we all want to do. So that was knowledge, and now we're going to talk about critique. Critique or criticism. I use the words interchangeably. One's just a fancy word for the other. I don't believe that you can, like, you can criticize somebody badly, but you can also criticize them well. So I don't take issue with the word. But I want to start off before we get to the criticism with talking about some ideas. And one of the important ideas to me is this layer area objects, if you will, in the design artifacts um, and what we create. So there's standards, there's guidelines, there's patterns, and there's principles for me. You may have your own hierarchy, but this is what's working for me. And the standards are the things you have to do to be interoperable with a the system. There's no other reason to standardize something unless you want to interoperate, I just made up a word, I think, unless you want to work with other systems. And an electrical system, a utility, needs to have standards because the utility isn't the same company building the outlets, nor is it the same company building the electronics that have to plug into those outlets. So it relies on a standard that it has to be. Five, but I started late. 
Um, you need standards for interoperability. You need guidelines if you're going to um, want to communicate something across a wide organization or a broad community. The guidelines aren't what you have to do. They're suggestions in order to keep things consistent. Um, you want to make sure that the organization follows it, but you can't control it. And that's what guidelines come in. You have patterns. Patterns are not best practices. They are the canonized, meaning widely, so widely used that it's, they become a definition of itself. Right? That's what a pattern is. In this case, it's a pattern of park layout and making sure that you keep people curved inwards so they can be having a conversation with each other. It's the pattern of the park. And when you see a park go the other way, where the big bench is on the outside, it means that you want to create moments of isolation. Right? And there's purpose to it, there's a why, there's a problem that you're trying to solve, and what you're trying to do. And all of this is outlined in this beautiful, really thick book called The Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. And um, while it's thick, it's also really good to read. But then there's principles. And I love the Microsoft principles in Windows 8. I do not use a Microsoft device in any kind anymore. But I love their principles that they came up with. And my favorite one is the one I put up there as craftsmanship, is the detail matters. Right? And that by itself isn't really that important, but it's the other ones that matter as well. That it's alive, that, it's, um, that it uses the content first, right? and that they make sure it goes across all of the medium. And it's principles to me that make sure that we have good criticism in your world. These are another set of principles, another kind of principles, which are for the world, and not for any one product. These are principles of good design. And if you're not doing this, and you're not doing Jacob Nielsen's heuristics, and you're not doing Bruce Hogmazowski's first principles, you're not even having the table stakes. So for your own organization, you shouldn't be creating these kinds of principles, right? Or using these kinds of principles. Those are table stakes that you start with. But the principles that work describe your product or your service or your system before you finish it. So that when you put the principles afterwards, it feels like a description. And that's why I love the Microsoft principles. They accurately describe Windows 8 and Metro interface. Love it for that. But separately, it can be for anyone. Everyone should be craftsmanship. Apple does craftsmanship, beautiful craftsmanship. But they don't do content first. So that's different. It's the combination of the two that makes the principles unique. So principles, where do they come from? They come from your design process. You, they emerge from the system. But my favorite way that they emerge is through your story. And while telling your story, principles emerge. So when in our class yesterday, Someone was telling a story about how he just has to get out of bed in the morning. He can't hit snooze. Snooze is not an option because he just keeps hitting snooze and before he knows it, it's time for lunch, right? So he has to get out of bed and so he puts his alarm clock in the shower, right? That was his design company, right? Another person who had the same problem had a spring-loaded bed that just dumped her out of bed, right? But their combined principle was mission critical and no excuses, right? It just has to happen. There's no way out, no escape clause. And that emerged from the stories that they did. But stories evolve through your process and so will your principles. And the way that you create a story is you start out by telling it, but then you move to acting it out so that you and others in your studio environment can experience it. And through the experience of it, you figure out what's a principle worth keeping, what's a part of the story worth keeping, and also what's missing. So we're going to talk more quickly about how to use principles in criticism. The most important part of a criticism session is not the criticism. It's the delivery of the person whose design is being presented. And when you deliver it, you have to deliver it to the principles that the group has agreed to, 
or that you are saying you want them to agree to. You have to have goals. And if you don't have those goals communicated, then there's no basis of criticism, except for table stakes, which everyone should know anyway, and yes, you do that. You have to make sure you meet your table stakes. You have to make sure you meet their requirements. And the way to do that is the people who are giving the critique have to make that person pay up on the promises that they suggested when they delivered the ideas. You have to hold that to them. And you hold that to them by asking them, does this meet your goals? I'm not seeing it meet your goals. Do you think it meets your goals? And if so, how does it meet your goals? And you're not asking them for a solution. What you're asking them for is to think with you. And maybe they have to go back and think about it and then come back to you later. But the criticism doesn't tell. The criticism acts. It's really important. But you also get to suggest. You get to say, this isn't working for me. Would this be better? Because it's a collaboration going on. And you want to work together. So on that point, I believe that what's inherently important is creating a culture which is a space, a knowledge set, a practice, and an experience of criticism that all come together to form a studio environment that best take advantage of the happy accidents that happen through a really solid design process. And I hope you go back and really see the places where you're missing in your culture and places where you're succeeding and amplify the places where you succeed and try to shore up the places where you're not doing the things that help you most. Thank you.